Welcome back to Tectonic 2.0, the National AI Summit. We are here in the opening panel of the day. So we have heard a lot of plans from the minister, but now let's start to dig down to what it all means in practice. What does the intersection of artificial and intelligence and manufacturing actually look like? What are the applications? Why is this so important to Australia's future? And I have to say, we've put together quite possibly the best panel you could put together in Australia to answer these questions. And remember, you get to ask your own questions to the panel. You have that Q&A section on the right side of your screen when you're watching this. So you can pose questions, you can upvote other questions. All right, rather than introducing all of the panelists at one time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each of them and ask them each to share from their own experience, an example of AI in manufacturing. Because all of them have such broadly different experience that we'll see that AI in manufacturing is not simply one thing. It is a whole new galaxy. It is waiting to be explored. So let's begin with Dr. John Whittle. John is the director of the Data 61 division of CSIRO. John, good afternoon to you. Hi, Mark. All right, can you share with us something that you've seen at this intersection of artificial intelligence and manufacturing? Sure, absolutely, Mark. Um, so yeah, I, I guess probably the first thing to say is that as you've kind of hinted there, um, AI for manufacturing is a very broad area. And that's largely because, you know, not only is AI a broad area, but also manufacturing um, as it's interpreted in the modern era is also a very broad area. And I think manufacturing nowadays, you know, it's not just about what we might immediately think of when we hear the word manufacturing, which is, you know, um, products going through an assembly line. Um, but there's a lot more to manufacturing than that. You know, you've got various processes in pre-production, production, also post-production. And so if you look at pre-production, you know, you've got the design elements of manufacturing, you've got how do you optimize processes, then you come to production itself and you've got, you know, quality control, you've got warehouse efficiency, inventory management, equipment maintenance, workplace safety, and even cybersecurity of factories, because some factories can be considered as critical infrastructure. And then even in post-production, you've got the whole supply chains and, you know, how do you collect data from end users to improve products? So manufacturing is really, really broad. And I would say that AI, it can, can change every single aspect of that manufacturing process, whether it's that pre-production, whether it's production, or whether it's post-production. Um, so as, as you said, Mark, I think it's, it's hard to give one example um, that kind of clearly illustrates what AI manufacturing is. But certainly when I think of the examples that I've seen, the things that excite me are where we've got AI algorithms and human workers working together. And I can give just maybe just quickly a few examples from some of the work that we're doing at CSIRO that illustrates this. So in our Victoria um, Clayton facility, we've got something called the Mixed Reality Lab. And this is using augmented reality to allow engineers to better detect defects in products. Um, so what they're doing is they're using um, off-the-shelf camera systems and then um, taking those camera images of an object that's been manufactured and then using you know, virtual 3D technology to superimpose on top of that a representation of what the product should, like in an, should look like in an ideal world. And that enables an engineer to more quickly and efficiently see defects that may be present in the object. So it's a really good example of where you've got, you know, it's, it's not just about the AI detecting the defect, it's also about you know, the human being working in concert with the AI. And on a similar vein to that, you know, we've also worked with a, a major car component manufacturer um, to produce an analytics dashboard for defect detection. And that's been shown to reduce casting defects in car parts by up to 50%. So again, it wasn't about them. It wasn't about that machine learning doing the job. It was about machine learning producing that analytics dashboard that the human being could then interpret. But there's lots of other examples as well. As well, we've, we've done work within Data61 on applying computer vision within factory environments, for example. So some of the work we've done is about how do you optimize the way that robots move around a factory floor? 
Um, typically, these robots might have onboard cameras, but that only allows them to see what's in front of them. It doesn't allow them to see what's around the corner. So if you combine that with computer vision from fixed cameras around the factory floor, you can then get an intelligent system that can optimize the way that the robots move around the factory and make things more efficient. And even in things like workplace safety, again, if you've got humans still on the factory floor that are still needed for some tasks that might be more intricate or perhaps more complex, um, you know, there's, there's workplace safety issues and we've got some work where we've been using computer vision to automatically detect um, work, worker posture, for example, to help them avoid injuries or even monitoring um, automatically for signs of fatigue in workers, which, as we know, is a major cause of accidents in the factory environment. So I think probably the, the, the summary of all of that is that there isn't, there isn't one example that sums up what AI and manufacturing means. It's a whole range of things, and, and that's the challenge in many ways, is how do we integrate all of that together? And certainly for companies trying to adopt these things, where, where do they start? And once they do start, how do they integrate all the different moving pieces? Okay, so, I mean, you're really reinforcing this idea that this is a vast landscape that we are really only just starting to explore. Thank you so much, John. Next, we're going to turn to Dr. Sue Kay, Chief Executive Officer of the Queensland AI Hub. Good afternoon, Sue. Yeah, hi, Mark. So what have you seen? What can you tell us about the future of manufacturing? Well, I think manufacturing in Australia was really going to rely very heavily on artificial intelligence because of the nature of the type of manufacturing that we do here. I mean, in general, Australia, uh, you know, focuses on niche manufacturing. So it's always low volume, often highly customised um, production, which really lends itself to the application of artificial intelligence because of the sheer volume of data that's sometimes necessary to be able to control that process. We're never going to be a country that's doing high volume volume um, manufacturing. We don't have electrical component manufacturing as an important, you know, mix, part of the mix. And so, you know, where um, uh, I think this is going to become increasingly important is not just because of the complexity of the type of manufacturing that we do, but also, um, you know, because in many areas, and I've just come back from central Queensland, we're facing real labour shortages, not just in our agricultural sector, but in our manufacturing sector. So one of the local manufacturers up there employs 60 people. They have 20 open and vacancies. And so they're actively looking at how they can apply artificial intelligence to streamline their processes and make them more efficient so that they can overcome that um, unfortunate lack of um, supply in terms of uh, labour. But I think in terms of additive manufacturing, I think artificial intelligence just makes sense. There's a number of different complex factors at play um, and whether that be for plastics, composites or metals. And uh, you really just have to apply AI to ensure the accuracy and quality of the manufactured parts. So some of the complexities that you get in form, material properties and integrity, particularly in metal parts produced by 3D printing, can all be related to a lot of the complexities of using lasers in this process. So the parts will vary depending on the power of the laser, the speed, the spot size, how much overlap there is between passes of the laser, uh, you know, what the exact powder composition is, how much um, a contamination there might be in the powder. And all of these things, if you, you know, set them up with, you know, high speed cameras, which are following exactly what the laser is doing. If you apply artificial intelligence, then you can actually start to change the process of the 3D printing while you're making the part so that you can reduce the possibility that you're going to be, um, producing low quality parts. So in a, in a process like additive manufacturing, AI is really just an essential part of, of that process. Uh, and if we don't use it, then you have a lack of reproducibility, which means we can't use these um, types of manufacturing techniques for developing critical parts, like uh, for, um, for example, those used in aircraft. So uh, one example um, is a local manufacturer using artificial intelligence for its automatic fiber placement process. 
Uh, they found that it's actually improved the prediction of their defects, which normally they would detect by physics modelling. Um, so their typical defect detection rate would have been 35%. But now that they're applying artificial intelligence, that defect detection rate is 98%. They've also found that artificial intelligence is very useful in terms of informing them the best way that they can inject and cook the materials that they're using. Uh, and they've also seen a 60% improvement in cycle time and the performance of the product during the curing process simply by monitoring the temperature profiles uh, and combining this with um, modelling that they've been, been doing using synthetic data. The same manufacturer is also starting to experiment with how this can be used to their 3D metal printing process. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a whole heap of data that you have to consider when you're, you're looking at the applications of uh, lasers to particularly powders. Um, and they're already seeing some improvements in that metal defect prediction, which is a, a, a far less stable process than fibre placement. So, I mean, I think artificial intelligence just makes sense. And particularly for country, a country like Australia, where we do this niche manufacturing, uh, and the most important thing is that we start to get people on board with how we can um, apply artificial intelligence and make it more accessible to the workers in these industries. Wow. And so you're really pointing to something that, that John was also pointing out, which is that AI helps humans work better, right? That it's not an us versus them, but it is, in fact, it improves our ability to get work done. And I, I, I'm interested in what you said about this this body shortage, you know, is one of the accidental outcomes of having a really long border closure going to be that we have to lean into AI to deal with the fact that we don't have people coming into the country in the same way? Yes, well, I think it's fair to say that uh, people have been able to keep their labour costs low by importing labour, uh, and that has not been possible during COVID. But I think, you know, there is also, I, I don't think it's necessarily a, um, a, a trade-off in as much as, uh, you know, the uh, what we've also seen when co companies are becoming more um, efficient and profitable by using artificial intelligence, then often they will look to employ more people. So I wouldn't say, say it's a complete, it's a it's a one-to-one -one trade off between you know in, in putting the technology in place and necessarily replacing people but in situations where you do have labor shortages it, it can be a stopgap measure right and it takes some of the pressure off all right now we've got to turn to david chitter david is the chief executive officer and managing director of the innovative manufacturing service good afternoon david thanks mark and hello everybody um look at uh, Mark's asked us to pick a, a success story that we know about. And to John's point, this is a really hard thing to do, given how broad manufacturing is. Um, I, I always look at the value proposition. Uh, it's easy to get hung up on the technology itself, but arguably it isn't just about the technology. It's about the value you create. And it's about the value with AI initially about how you can capture value inside organization. Um, recent studies have revealed that the most popular AI use cases in manufacturing are improving although primarily this is about capturing value inside factories or businesses and is not yet really about that value creation outside in terms of across supply chains, sectors, or to create new business models. But that's where the exciting thing is going to come in the future. So, so where are the best examples? Well, not surprisingly, these are generally within factories. And also not surprisingly, many are led by the automotive industry around the world as that industry has led many of the recent transformation waves in manufacturing. Where companies are taking this up is probably a third of companies are taking up AI in the form of intelligent maintenance, okay? So using AI, organizations can predict, prepare for failures in equipment, uh, reducing or even avoiding downtime, uh, and using a lot of camera systems to be able to determine, for example, whether robots are starting to move slightly out of their patterns of behavior. Mm -hmm. Locally, we've seen companies like Movis uh, who remotely sense equipment vibration and they monitor and predict abnormal behavior and they can advise those companies, which, which is a significant cost saving, uh, particularly if you can't get another motor from within Australia and you're, and you're constrained by supply. So COVID's led to quite a bit of investment into getting much smarter about how you can manage maintenance sector Activities. Another big area of investment is in um, product or process quality inspection or assurance. And John mentioned some of the work that, that uh, Syro and Data61 are doing in that space. Uh, it's really about making sure that you avoid defects in production and how you can pick those up. But it's not just whether you've made a defect. It's also starting to predict things like whether your tools are degrading, whether your process is going out of parameters. And so you have companies like Audi and General Motors using cameras during 
uh, actually inside tools. So taking very high resolution images of, of aluminum or steel body panels being pressed, looking for micro cracks that humans simply wouldn't see. And what they're looking for is early indication of something that could cause uh, a fairly big downtime in the industry thereafter. Another one's in demand planning, um, looking at historical sales data, weather patterns, third party data, social media, macroeconomic. Uh, we're not seeing that trend in manufacturing yet, but you only have to look at people like Domino's Pizza, for example, uh, where they are able to predict in advance when pizza demand is going up or down. They know when we're going to order a pizza before we do, and even most likely the type of pizza, which is pretty amazing. So imagine that opportunity in manufacturing. The, the popularity in manufacturing is, is, uh, is because there is an inordinate amount of data in manufacturing. It's very complicated. You've got lots of suppliers, lots of raw materials. And so it's full of data that can be easily analyzed. And the point of this is that uh, it, it, you can do that not just in the production environment, but where the exciting stuff happens to me is when you look at it from a design perspective. Uh, artificial intelligence is now being used for things like generative design. So this is letting a computer loose on how to design a new component and not being constrained by typical design rules. Sue talked about 3D printing, additive manufacturing. Couple that up with generative design and you have the opportunity to design freedom, multiple iterations, and then to print it, to test it. If you embed sensors in the product that you put out to consumers, you can then track it through a digital twin and all of a sudden you get a real connection between products that are made what consumers are using, live digital twins, and all of that intelligence can be used to recreate and make better products almost down to a single component level. So sorry, there's not one example I've got, but, but it's an exciting space. And uh, there's just about every step from design and engineering through production logistics, even right through to how the consumers are using products and services, the end of life, how things can be repurposed. And there are enormous benefits to be gained across the platform. And we actually saw this last week. Google announced that they designed a new AI chip using AI, right? That they, in fact, were able to do the chip layout in a way that a human being couldn't do. And, and so we are actually now seeing that become enfolded into the design techniques that we're using. Thank you very much, David. Finally, O. Vignella is the chief technology officer of the very newly created Australian Space Agency. Now, O, do you have undoubtedly seen some interesting intersections between AI manufacturing and this new space race that we seem to be having? It's not just the billionaires, right? Everyone is going and playing in space these days. So tell us what you've seen. In, indeed. Um, thanks. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, have to, uh, I have to say it's really interesting to hear uh, all of you speaking and, and also hearing that we the government is going to invest in developing in AI and uh, especially uh, help supporting the talent growth because we as you know the, the goal of the space agency is to create 20,000 new jobs in the next 10 years and, and a lot of them are going to be in AI and application in space so it's uh, it's good to plan the, the future. Uh, I need to echo John, Sue, David, everything you say is, uh, is applicable to space. Uh, when I hear uh, robots and remote operation from you, John, of course, when you're thinking about going to the moon and, and further to Mars, we're going to need re remote operation and robotics to prepare all the infrastructure before sending uh, women and men there. So uh, a big application there. Uh, when I hear you, Sue, talking about defect and performance, you know that if something breaks in space, you, you can't really send someone to fix it soon. So having this AI technology to predict what's going to fail and to fix it before it fails is, uh, it is very important. So this, uh, I really liked what you mentioned about defects and, and performance. Um, and David, uh, hearing digital twins, uh, that's also something that uh, is being used more and more. Um, before sending a spacecraft in the old days, in the old space where I come from, you used to start doing a, a prototype model and then an engineering model, and then you would build your, your flight model and you would do a lot of tests on these different models. Now you have a digital twin and you can modelize everything using AI, using, using machine learning, um, and you can almost skip all these all these stages and, and go directly to your, to your flight model. Now, Two examples, and I agree with you, David, it's going to be hard just to pick two examples because there are so many. Um, first, in advanced manufacturing, 
until now when you were designing a piece of equipment um, and especially in space it's it's such a harsh environment that the constraint of vacuum and, and thermal, thermal high temperature and low temperature are really harsh and uh, you were limited into the tools in in your disposition to build what you were going to design so especially when you think about tanks having a perfect a perfect sphere was was a really nice thing to have but how do you manufacture that with advanced manufacturing all these constraints are, are disappeared um, so the creativity in designing uh, components systems subsystem is is completely new and and it's a it's great field to be in just now because advanced manufacturing is a, is opening a door or to, uh, to a lot of, of different design and, and, and pieces. In terms of AI, I need to, uh, to mention that uh, we have a couple of, of companies, organization and research center in, in Australia in AI who are, who are very, very good. And, and they've, they've found some application in space that they were not expecting to find. And one example is, as you know, our orbits are starting to be very, very congested. Um, before we were concentrating on geo, so 36,000 kilometers uh, above uh, the, the Earth. And, and everybody was there, you don't move, you're always at the same place. Now with this constellation in low Earth orbit, so between 800 and, and 1200 kilometers, and this is where you need to have a lot of satellites if you want to have a, a full coverage of, of the planet. So we have thousands and thousands of spacecraft now in lowest observation, and that's creating a danger because they can collide. So it's important to know where these um, objects are in any point in time, but it's also important to predict when they're going to be. And, and space is, a, is an interesting environment. You have the, the solar pressure that you need to take into account. So you need to modelize all this. And AI is, is actually used to predict a, a collision and to try to advise on a maneuver to do to avoid collision. And, and the European Space Agency a while ago did a, a competition to say who has some AI example to use to solve this problem of, of um, predicting collision. And it's actually uh, the uh, AI and, and machine learning center in Adelaide who won that competition. So all, all that to say that um, first of all, space um, is a new market for anyone doing any technology. I think any technology on Earth uh, as, a, as an application in space um, and AI and advanced manufacturing uh, has, has a great, great role to play. And the last thing I would say, if I look into the future, some people are telling me, you know, what we're going to do in the future is probably just send cartridges into space because we're going to have 3D printer in orbit or on the moon or, or on Mars. And you just manufacture whatever you want and design whatever you want. You just have to send the cartridges up and, and why not? So that's what I love about this job is you can be futurist and, uh, and, and, and God knows what's, uh, what tomorrow is going to look like. But um, there, there is no limit to our ambition and our visions. Yeah, I just, I, I, I would, anyone who's had to fuck with a printer cartridge is now living <laughs> in fear because of that future. <laughs> We, work right. on it. <laughs> we have some great examples from the panelists of AI and manufacturing and all of the different ways that it will touch the work. And we've heard from the minister, there's policy, there's plan. So let's start to connect a few of the dots here. And so we have some questions. First one I want to address to John after that. Any of you want to respond, please feel free. So, John, we have heard from the minister that there's money in the budget. Uh, there's one and a half billion for the new manufacturing, around 150, 125 million for AI specifically. What kinds of investments do we need to be looking at at this intersection between AI and manufacturing? And for how long and how patient are we going to need to be before we can expect to see some results? Yeah, good question. And um, before I answer that, I, I have to just, uh, and I was, I was getting a nostalgia listening to Ord talk about space. Um, so I, I used to work at NASA back in um, the early 2000s. And in fact, um, worked with a lot of the groups that were doing very um, early AI for space. Um, uh, so, so hearing some of the applications that Ord was talking about that, I remember back then there was a really interesting application called Livingston, which was essentially um, a AI model 
for um, fault detection and maintenance that was actually um, uh, applied on an actual deep space probe. So it would basically map the, the state of the spaceship and, and, and compare that to what the expected state was. And then if it wasn't what it expected, it would take corrective action. And I think it's, it's always interesting to see that there is these certain technologies that are developed, but one of the challenges we have is often actually getting them into practice because the technology in a way is the easy bit. Um, but then putting that into a, a whole ecosystem and getting them actually used in practice can, can often take a lot longer. Um, but com coming back to your question, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll, I mean, the, the minister um, talked about a number of new investments from the government in this area. Maybe I'll just talk about a couple of them that were mentioned that CSIRO is taking a lead on. So the first of those is this National AI Center that was announced in the budget a few weeks ago. So this is a $53 million investment. It, it really consists of a number of parts. So it's the coordinating center, which is uh, gonna be led by CSIRO and then four digital capability centers attached to that. And they will each focus on particular themes and there'll be a kind of open process for deciding those themes. But what, you know, I, if, if I was a, I don't know what the themes will be, but if I was a betting man, I, I, I would put my money on saying that there will be at least one of those capability centers focused on AI for manufacturing. It certainly seems like an obvious thing to do. Um, but within the coordinating center, we're, we're gonna be focusing on how can we build that ecosystem nationally for AI uh, more generally and uh, including AI for manufacturing. Um, and as well as the ecosystem building activities, you know, we're going to be looking at various cross-cutting themes that come up again and again whenever you try to develop and apply AI. Um, things like, you know, how do you develop AI in a responsible and ethical way? How do you ensure that you've got diversity and inclusion in AI? And, you know, what kind of infrastructure and compute power do you need to support AI? Um, so I think that's a really, you know, that National AI Center is a really exciting development to me. Um, I, I always say that Australia's got phenomenal capability in AI. Actually, if you look at various rankings, you know, Australia always does really, really well in those global rankings, but we do tend to have quite a fragmented ecosystem. And I think given the, the size of the country that we are, we do need to do a better job of just bringing all of that expertise and capability together. And that's certainly um, the, the philosophy behind the National AI Center. Um, one of the other initiatives that the minister mentioned was this Next Generation AI Graduates Program, which is about a $25 million investment. And in fact, there's also a, another $22 million for a similar program called Next Generation Emerging Technologies Graduates Program. And together, these will fund up to around 500 scholarships in AI and other related technologies. Um, again, not manufacturing specific, but I, I expect that there will be lots of opportunities for AI for manufacturing there. Um, and the plan behind those graduate programs is that we're gonna take a little bit of a different approach and rather than just funding individual students to do individual projects, um, we're gonna try and create cohorts of students that can actually work together and work in very close collaboration with industry partners so that you've got maybe groups of 10 to 20 students all working on a similar problem, working with an industry sponsor and solving you know, real, real problems as part of their studies. So I think you know, those two initiatives in particular that we're gonna be taking the lead on, but also the other initiatives announced in the budget, I think a really good platform for us to build on to start to mobilize the very, very strong capability that we've got across the country. Any of the other panelists like to respond? So uh, let me just uh, reflect for a moment, John. It sounds like we're talking about, particularly because we're talking about research. Research is amazing, but slow. So it sounds like this is something where we're going to need to really decide that we're settling down for a decade or more, both with the investment, but also with the effort before we really start to see this bear fruit. And I'd say yes and no to that. Um, so, so first of all, the National AI Center is not necessarily about research. In fact, it's got to focus more on business adoption, but, but, more, but more generally, the, the point is, is well taken. Um, I, I think the answer is that there is, there's some stuff that you can do now 
and you know my colleagues on the panel have given lots of examples of real things that are that are happening um, now. Um, but then you've got the other extreme of that, which is the full vision of you know what they call Industry 4.0, where you know AI is being used in every part of the manufacturing process, and it's all a kind of it's all integrated and it's a very holistic approach. Now that is going to take a longer time, and in fact. You know, if you look at other countries across the world that are further along in that journey, they are still quite early in their journey. So Industry 4 as a term was really invented in Germany about 10 years ago. Um, but there's a, re a recent report that came out of, um, uh, there was a survey of German manufacturing industry. And that said that, there were, you know, on a maturity model for Industry 4.0, there's really only about 4% of companies that are, um, well progressed along that maturity model. So I think to do the, the, the all singing, all dancing, you know, AI is everywhere um, approach will take some time, but, you know, that doesn't stop us taking incremental steps um, and, and doing it bit by bit and getting real value out of those in the short term, and that's already happening. I think uh, just to echo John's comments, um, there's a recent survey in Germany across about 600 manufacturers, and they're honest enough to say only 8% of them are actually using AI, but a quarter are planning uh, investments in AI. And so I guess there's a, a pent-up demand. It's interesting. It depends which part of the manufacturing industry you're from, because if you uh, have been embracing for many years lean manufacturing, you have a culture of data analytics, you have a culture of data-driven decisions, mm -hmm. then AI is low-hanging fruit for you. And, and you may get confused by terminology such as separating it as AI. It's just a continued journey of another level, another set of technology and tools that you can apply to better analyze data to make real-time decisions. The reality, however, in Australia is that lean manufacturing is not embraced wholesale throughout every part of manufacturing. And industry four has also been a slow take up in Australia. Um, we don't have data yet on how AI is being taken up, but I think there's some strengths we can play to. Uh, companies that we work with that are working with universities, we've got over 50 projects we're co-funding. Many of them, these research projects in industry four are embracing machine learning technology during the research. So the universities are helping to educate the companies on data analytics, machine learning, and AI. Another opportunity is to look at things like 5G in Australia, where we would be one of the most advanced nations in the world. Uh, our long distances, what, what are the things that actually we could be world leaders in, in terms of creation of technology because of some competitive advantage we already have? Those are the, those are the opportunities for us. And I, you bring up a question that I actually want to ask Sue now, which has to do sort of w where our inherent advantages are. So, Sue, we've been hearing a lot about adding AI to industrial processes using industrial robots, whether we're sticking a camera in them so we can see defects or whatever. Do we make industrial robots here in Australia? And if not, then who are we doing this work for and how can it benefit us here? Yeah, no, we make zero industrial robots in Australia. And I find it really frustrating that sometimes we confuse ado adoption of AI versus creation of AI technology because industrial robots themselves uh, are a form of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you have a look at countries like China, they have been um, very strategic in their ambitions to actually have sovereign supply of the industrial robots that they then use in manufacturing. So by last year, China uh, had the ambition to have the world's highest robot population density, which means that's the number of industrial robots per 10,000 employees, which if you do a back of the envelope calculations means that they uh, have more industrial robots in China than we have people in Australia. Um, now, they haven't succeeded in becoming the world's number one country. Singapore has that title. However, they have secured sovereign supply of industrial robots to support their manufacturing industry. And I think that, you know, you could argue that's not playing to Australia's niche, niche strengths. But I think if COVID has shown us anything, we have to be very careful about our sovereign supply of technologies like this. And I'd probably like to expand the conversation to look at what are the new industries that we really need to be supporting 
reporting to help us to uh, be applying AI in manufacturing in a way that benefits more um, than just the individual manufacturer that could actually allow us to build additional industries here in Australia and then that we can use to export that technology to other parts of the world. Because certainly Australia has a lot of strengths in the uh, development and manufacture of service robots, which are distinct from industrial robots. So those are robots that you apply in agriculture or in the mining environment, typically outside robots. Um, there's no reason that we couldn't also be good at uh, supplying robots into manufacturing. But at the moment, yes, a lot of our effort is about applying AI capabilities to a technology that's not even developed here in Australia. All right. So if we want to then focus this effort around something that will bring benefits to the country, that will lean into our own strengths, does that mean that we need to rethink what we're doing around where we're applying AI? And if you have this vision of there's some low hanging fruit here, some things that make natural sense. I mean, and obviously agriculture and mining are two of them. Are there others that we can start to think of? Yeah, I think developing our sensing systems. I mean, uh, I think sovereign uh, capability, we hear a lot of this from the defence industry, but I don't think we hear enough of it in our manufacturing industry, arguably, which is supplying into defence, because uh, if you are having sensors and robots being developed in other countries and then applied here, you always have the risk of Trojan hardwares. So, ha yeah, hardware Trojans uh, infiltrating the system. So I think we also need to really consider we invest a lot in cybersecurity in Australia, mm -hmm. but we're not really investing in the development of a lot of our sovereign technology capability. And, and I'd like to see a, a bit more of a focus on that. Would anyone like to respond? Any other panellists? Maybe I'll just, just make a comment. I mean, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with anything that, that Sue has just said, but maybe just a couple of thoughts. I mean, first of all, I think, it, it, you know, AI and manufacturing, it's not just about robots. Um, I think a lot of the, the examples that we've heard about today, you know, it's, it's the full range of what we would consider AI, whether that's machine learning, computer vision, um, human machine interaction and, and so forth. Um, the, the, the other maybe point to make is that, you know, there are areas in Australia that we do have incredible strength in parts of AI, maybe not in industrial robots. Um, but if you look at computer vision um, as an area, for example, I mean, the um, the AIML Institute at the University of Adelaide is ranked second in the world, according to some rankings for computer vision, um, R&D. Um, and if you look at some of our own work that we do in CSIRO, actually within our robotics team, although we're not building our own robots, we're doing a lot of work putting an intelligent software on robots. And we're currently ranked fourth in the world in a DARPA competition using robots to explore um, underground environments um, in fact, Sue led that work when she was at uh, Data 61, so she'll probably know it better, better than I. But so, so I think I think Sue's right. Um, but let, let's not forget that we do have strength in, in, in other areas as well. So it's, it's not all bad. Sue? So, uh, yeah, sorry. sorry. No, I just wanted to echo Sue's concerns. I, I have to say when we are looking into where we want to be in 10 years' time in, in space, we are also, and I think... COVID has made us realize how dependent we are on a lot of critical technology. AI is one. And um, I think the plan announced today is, is, is trying to um, address that. And um, advanced manufacturing is definitely another one. And the modern manufacturing initiative, a 1.3 billion, is, is also trying to address that. Uh, another example, when we were uh, devastated by the bushfire more than uh, a year ago, uh, we we needed to look into uh, how to use Earth observation data from space to see how we could help managing that crisis with the bushfire. And none of the data were coming from uh, Australian space assets. Uh, so I think there is an, a very thorough um, reflection within the government today um, and realizing that you know, either we accept this dependency or, or we do something about it. And, and I think there is a lot of uh, thinking going through this. And, and this two example of, of investment is a, is a start. But uh, I, I echo your concerns. Uh, so. so on that topic of, yes. Sorry, the, the challenge we have in Australia, which is more acute than most other markets in the world that are industrialized, is that the very large majority of companies who operate in manufacturing are small businesses, um, very small businesses by global standards. 
And also, we don't have large industries that typically have a big customer at the top that drives hundreds of suppliers through a tiered supply chain. In other words, if, like, an, if like Gen- an auto manufacturer, like an auto manufacturer, and and, and look, we we had that. Um, we, so what we're missing is someone at the top saying you're all going to meet this cybersecurity standard within 12 months or you're not part of the supply chain. And everybody jumps very high in that process. So the challenges we have in Australia are unique in terms of how we have to address it. There is an opportunity, though, to say we've picked six primary industry sectors that the company, that the country wants to grow in. That should stimulate investment. But there are also real opportunities at the platform level. So think of how AI can help us solve um, better energy use, all right, better material mm. use, um, better assurance of the provenance and high quality of food and beverages that we export. You know, that yeah. these are strengths and things that Australia is already globally renowned for. We can't stand still in that space. We've got to invest. And, and AI is a really obvious technology to take and apply at a platform type level. Because if you wait for individual companies to do it, we're still waiting for individual companies to embrace lean manufacturing and industry four. So there's an option to leapfrog with that, with artificial intelligence, but there's also some challenge and platform approach that we need to be looking at as well. But, but Dave, you, Dave, you point to some of the inertia issue. Now, we are very comfortable being fast followers in this country. We're less comfortable being leaders. And what you're pointing to is that, in fact, particularly in areas where we already have established strengths in manufacturing, that we are going to need to be leaders. So what do we do to remove some of that inertia around AI? I think the first thing is demystify what AI is and what it isn't. Um, it, it's it's very easy. We had this same challenge, I'd argue, with Industry 4.0 a few years ago, where uh, actually Industry 4 was nothing more than a collection of technologies that have been used in industry for 20 or 30 years. Um, 3D printing, computer simulation, robotics uh, have been around for a long time, but they were very expensive and you had to have very customized skills and they had to be in very controlled environments. That's not the case with these technologies anymore. They're they're almost open source, available and and at a cost that companies can afford. So the challenge to me is is don't get hung up by the terminology. Um, If we start I think it's important to define what AI is versus simple data analytics, okay? But I think what we need to build is a culture of data matters. And da- and it's not about the information that data creates. It's, it's actually thinking through how can that data create, turn it into dollars for me, all right? And, and so you've got to think through how can I use this to save money or improve things in my business or to create a new business model. And I think to Sue's point, we, we, we are not going to be manufacturing everything in Australia. That, that is not the pathway um, that I think ultimately we're heading despite COVID. But we also need to build business models that we can take to the world because we'll still be part of a global world. And it may not be necessarily products or processes, but know-how, software platforms, services, and smart designs that are enabled by machine learning and artificial intelligence. I think that's a golden opportunity for us. Wow. Okay. So... If we have this idea that there is easy, there are easy pickings here, right? Then what we need to, st- how do we start to think differently about that? I mean, is it just simply an education task? And all of you, I think, because you probably all confront this in your work. How do you think about what it takes to remove inertia here? I, I, maybe I'll, I'll just open up. I think one of the answers is uh, is collaboration, uh, and and we're, we're generally not great at collaboration between businesses, between research organisations. Uh, it's taken a national cabinet to get some collaboration, even at the federal and state level. But the reality is, a- AI is a common opportunity and and a common challenge. It may not be actually what you end up competing on. All right, so it may be something that clusters of companies. Uh, partner can partner up, work with your local university, uh, engage some data scientists. There's there's smart ways to do it without trying to do it all yourself. You've also got to be, I think, have an appetite to take some ambition and and take on a bit of risk. But the good thing is with things like digital twins and 3D printing, you can Mm -hmm. test things in a virtual world, in a prototype Mm -hmm. world without actually disrupting your current production. So, all of these technologies that this industry for and AI enables, 
allow you to test and develop things offline much more rapidly and much more safely than they would do if you tried to disrupt production. I think if we can raise that awareness that these are not expensive technologies, relatively easy to access, and if you can do it through collaboration, you'll find a way to get on the journey and you'll be surprised at how quickly you can move. Yeah. Oh, you are in the midst of publishing, I think you said it's eight different technology roadmaps for the space agency. Is that correct? You've done the first one, the second one's coming out, the sixth one coming this year. How, how have you positioned AI and manufacturing inside of those roadmaps? That, that's a very good question. Um, first of all, how we picked up seven areas um, when we got created almost three years ago now, so we're not that young anymore. We had the choice of starting doing everything and anything in space or said, okay, let's, let's stop two seconds and let's pick areas where we think that we have a, a great future and a great role to play. Um, and to your comment, David, when you say we're not going to manufacture everything in Australia, I agree with you. And that's the approach we are taking in the roadmap as well. Why did we pick up these areas? It's because either there is a market, there is a need, there is a user uh, to fill. And, and often people do things without really thinking, is there a market? So is there a market, is there a need, or is there a good reason as to why we need to have this capability in Australia? That's the two simple reasons as to why we've picked this, uh, these areas. Uh, so they are PNTs for obvious reasons, um, with the size of, uh, of the country, Earth observation, uh, communication, space situational awareness because of the number of debris around the Earth and, uh, and also because we look at the southern hemisphere sky from mm. where we are. So we have a, a uniqueness there. Um, remote operation, the 40 years of uh, uh, industry we have in, in mining, we know how to do remote operation. When you go to, to Perth, you, you can see that all the Rio Tinto, Woodside and so forth, they are operating from Perth activities that are 2,000 kilometers away. So uh, we, we can export that to the moon and Mars in, uh, in a blink uh, and access to space. So yet there is no AI or advanced manufacturing roadmap, but... By doing all these roadmaps, and the first one we uh, we've issued was on communication and technology in, uh, in December, and, and there are a couple who are about to be published. We've identified some cross-cutting technologies, some cross-cutting services, and some enablers that are applicable to all of the areas. And five technologies are across all of these areas. AI is the first one. Advanced manufacturing is another. Cyber security, which is a, you can't talk about AI and data without thinking of cyber technology. Um, we have digital data driven as well. We have a, a, few, a few services, but AI and advanced manufacturing is, is, is different, definitely one. Um, a few examples of AI, I've, I've given the uh, SSA example, but when you look at position, navigation, and timing, you know, when you use your phone to, to go from A to B, your phone is doing a bit of artificial intelligence to tell you this is the quickest way, this is the way without toll, this is the way where there's less traffic. So you're using AI all the time when, when you're thinking of PNT. Um, Earth observation is the, is the same thing. You have now satellites who have on board some very, I would even say much machine learning, maybe not even AI. They're taking a picture, they realize there is a cloud, they dis discard the picture and they won't take a bandwidth to send you the, the data of that picture because it will be irrelevant. If it's a, a spectral camera, so you can take different um, spectral band um, picture of, of where you are. And if you see, oh, I need that picture in, in, I, in AR, they will do it automatically. Um, so they will be able, when the satellite is above the point of interest, they'll be able to take this, this picture in the specific band that, that you need to receive and you need to, uh, uh, you need to address. Um, so lots of, of, of the AI in Earth observation. Comms is the same thing. When you walk around and you want communication, you should not care if, if the signal is coming from a tower, from a lower satellite, from a high, uh, from a geo satellite on which band, if it's laser, if it's um, KA band, if it's C band, 
You just want your com. So there are going to be some intelligence behind what is the best signal that is around you and, and making sure that when you move from one point to the other, you have a continuous uh, a coverage there. Uh, so that's for AI really across all the, the area of, uh, of priorities. And advanced manufacturing as well. I mean, when, when you think about comms, uh, you need some materials in antennas that, uh, that only advanced uh, manufacturing can bring you. Um, when you think about instruments to put in space we ha we started a bit uh, the call there is uh, uh, you, you can also now design instrument that you can you couldn't dream of uh, so advanced manufacturing and ai are really across all these things and we are maybe thinking of extracting all that and at some point doing one roadmap that is just about AI and advanced manufacturing for all the space application, who, who knows? First, we need to go and, and, and publish the six remaining roadmap, um, but it's definitely a very strong um, domain and capability that, uh, that we need. Excellent. All right, we have time for a few questions for the audience and I think you guys know that there's a Q&A bar on the side of the screen, but first one that I wanna ask, and this is to all of the panelists, we've been asked, how do we integrate academia and PhD students with industry to collaborate and accelerate manufacturing, and I presume AI and manufacturing in Australia. How do we actually forge those connections? I can have a first go at that, because um, this is exactly what that next generation AI graduates program is meant to do. Um, so, you know, I think we need to get away from, say, the traditional PhD, which was, you know, um, individual students working on individual problems with individual supervisors in individual universities and move much more towards a collaborative model where we've got groups of students working with industry, working with, um, you know, other research institutes like CSIRO um, and working with multiple universities. Um, there are some um, reasonably good models of that from around the world. There's um, the um, Centers for Doctoral Training, they're called in the UK, that have been running for some years right now and have been quite successful in moving away from that kind of individual student to kind of groups of students and having bigger impact. Um, because of that, um, even within Australia, we've got, you know, ARC, ITTCs that have done that to a certain extent, but certainly within the um, Next Generation AI Graduates Program, there's an intention to take that cohort approach and put it on steroids, if you like, and, and really push on that collaborative element, which David was talking about earlier. Well, Mark, I'd, I'd suggest uh, throwing the net much wider. Um, PhDs are really the tip of the iceberg. And, and to your typical manufacturer, they haven't historically uh, gone out and sought PhD level uh, people because the challenges in a typical manufacturing business are probably are not sizable enough for, for your, your smart PhD student. You can work all the way back to undergrad students. I think key to this is, is revisiting things like internships and placements, whereby as you go through any part of your education journey as an undergrad, as an apprentice, you are spending time both within your education institute and also with industry. That would then apply to postgrads, to early career researchers, to master's students, and also to PhDs. So to me, it comes back to a bit of a cultural thing where companies uh, need to see universities and universities also need to see companies as partners in solving some of these problems mm. as opposed to talking different languages and having different cultures. And as opposed to seeing the university system as something that is meant to provide work-ready people for me to employ, it, it can't be seen as a simple throw it over the fence to me. It's got to be much more integrated. Hence, I come back to the collaboration opportunities. And there are all sorts of funds out there to help companies with the cost of engaging PhDs. And I mean, we've, got, we've got a PhD program. We've got a master's scholarship program. Um, the challenge is, is getting industry and university just to talk. And when they do great things happen and great ideas get shared, but it's that first conversation that you've got to get going. And, and just, to, um, just to clarify, so although I talked about PhDs in that Next Generation AI Graduates Program, it actually will focus as well on master's students and undergraduate students. I couldn't agree more. 
If I can uh, add to this, I'm a great believer in competition and challenge for, for provoking collaboration. Uh, so Minister Porter has announced uh, the AI plan launch, but he, he announced quite a, a few things for the space agency as well today. And one of them was uh, the 20 projects for demonstration program for the Moon to Mars program that we, uh, we are busy with. Um, and it's 20 collaboration between industry, research, and, uh, and, and I think the... the the key difficulty when you talk about collaboration is IP. The IP needs to be treated for the, on a case-to-case -case basis. And I think for me, that's the major challenge of having the industry working with research, working with, uh, uh, with students. And how are you going to manage the IP? Who owns it at the end? And, and what's the story mm -hmm. there? Um, but I invite you to, to read this, uh, this 20 demo um, feasibility study because there are some cool projects um, to, to bring uh, Australia um, back to space. Sue? Yeah, Mark, I, I think that what a lot of our manufacturers would like to see is some support in upskilling the workers that they have. So Griffith University has uh, just got some funding to help with, um, uh, you know, a women in STEM cadetship that is available for, um, you know, a diploma in computing and uh, data analytics where companies are actually given funds to free up people who are working for them so that they can upskill. And I think actually being able to provide programs like that is is really important because there's, I think as David pointed out, there's a whole range of skills that um, our modern manufacturers require. Sometimes they're picking up people from year nine um, mm. and to be able to cope with all of these AI enabled technologies, um, we need to be able to bring them along on the journey. Yeah, yeah, all right. Last question for all of you. This is another audience question and it's something we've touched on, but it does represent something that's a slightly alongside field. Are we looking at applications in AI in what we're now calling smart design, particularly partnerships with designers? And so we're not talking scientists, we're talking designers who are trained to use AI. I can just say quickly, um, there is a lot of exercise and, and project being done with designer and AI to look into how are we going to design a, a moon base? Um, what's the shape of, uh, of the habitat to take into account radiation and all these kind of things. So th there is some, some really interesting architectural plan that are available now and, and they've been done with designer and, and the, the help of AI. So very futuristic, not so much because we're going back in, a, in, in four years time, um, but this is something in space that is already being used greatly. And actually, if, if you look at the, I'm sorry, so if, you, if you look at the, if you look at the history of AI, um, the design element was always one of the motivating factors that drove the development of AI. Um, you, you mentioned, Mark, I think in your earlier comments about um, uh, the, the Google example of things being automatically designed by AI, but actually one of the very, very early examples of AI um, was AI in circuit design and um, automatically designing circuits. Um, um, but, but I think there is still quite, quite, quite a lot of interesting work to be done that there. So one of the kind of last frontiers of AI is often considered to be creativity and how can you get machines to be creative? And that was often considered by some to be impossible because machines can't be creative like human beings. But there are many, many examples now of AI that has created music or has created art that has been performed or has been exhibited in public galleries and members of the public wouldn't know the difference between that art and human generated art. So I, I, yeah, I do think there's lots of really, really interesting um, possibilities for when you bring the, the you know, human beings together with new forms of creativity that can come from AI. Sue? Uh, yeah, Mark, I wasn't sure. Are you suggesting that there are barriers to design people uh, engaging in AI? Because, you know, following on from what John said, I actually think our creatives are much more likely to use AI and not even question it just as a useful tool that helps expand the range of creativity. You know, Australia won last year's Eurovision AI song contest and the, mu musicians, the musicians never felt that they were being displaced by the AI. <laughs> they just saw it as a useful tool to expand the range of things that they could do and and I think our you know in in general design designers would use it in the same way. 
I mean, I, I guess part, part of that may be reflecting on the fact that design as an element has not been foregrounded in any of the discussions. And maybe this is an opportunity or an invitation to do that. David, do you want to just give us some closing words on that? We only have about another minute. Yeah, look, I, one of the examples I opened up earlier was about this concept of generative design. I, I'll give you a very simple example. Um, 3D printed inserts in the medical space to uh, replace bone that maybe needs to be removed either because you've had an accident or cancer. Um, the AI can work all that through in terms of being able to then 3D print something that actually mm. replicates the structure of bone. You imagine how long it would take for a designer to draw that up in an old fashioned way, okay? Whereas the, the AI algorithms can do that intuitively. And this is where I think it's about bolting bits of technology together. It's not about robotics on its own or 3D printing. It's about how AI can allow you to bring these different platforms together to create something that you simply cannot do any other way. That's the real opportunity that exists. Right, and that it's about new tools. All right. I'd like to thank John Whittle, Sue Kay, David Tudor, and Odd Vignelli. This concludes the opening panel section of Tectonic 2.0. We're going to take a 15-minute break for the breakout set until we start the breakout sessions. Once again, a bit of technical fluff here. Before we go into those four streams, you will need to tap on the live stream button once this stream ends, which is going to be in just a moment, and that will then take you to the next session. But the next session is going to be 15 minutes from now, so don't close any windows. Go get yourself a nice cuppa, have a comfort break, whatever you want to do, walk around a bit, and then you'll be able to join us again at 2.45. Thank all four of you very much. It has been a great pleasure working with you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.